Well, good morning. Hard to believe it's Friday already. Uh, I know our days are packed, but the weeks seem to fly by here. And I just want to say it's been a privilege to spend this week with you. I know for a, a few of you, this is your last chapel uh, for the week, and you'll be heading home tomorrow. And uh, many of you will be here next week, and I'm looking forward for, uh, to spending that week with you. But it's been a privilege and, and an honor to share in this week with you and to get to know some of you. I do want to encourage you, especially you that are leaving, uh, to do something, and that's to thank your counselors and your faculty, because they come here because they love you and they care about you and they want to invest in your lives. And so just let them know that you appreciate them, and uh, I know that would, uh, they'd really mean a lot to them. As we uh, begin our time in God's Word this morning, I want to begin with a question. Have you ever done something simply because someone told you not to do it? Right? Have you ever done something simply because someone told you that you couldn't do that? When I was growing up at my grandparents' house, they had a, a cactus, one of those that had the multiple leaves and spread across the ground, and everyone told me, don't touch the cactus. Well, one day, my mom and dad, I think, were there, my grandparents, and my grandfather was showing everybody his, his flowers, and they all went around the corner. And I was left alone with a cactus. And I thought, here is my moment, the opportunity. Because I know that touching the cactus must bring immense pleasure. It must bring incredible joy. And that's why they don't want me to touch it. And they can't stop me now. And so I went in and I grabbed it, right? And I can still to this day remember my grandmother kindly and patiently sitting me on her lap and pulling the thorns out one by one. Sometimes we, we think that what we're told not to do is being held, holding us back from something incredible and good. This morning, I, I want us to consider a verse that uh, or some words that Jesus shared before we jump into Philippians, and it's found in John chapter 14, verse 15. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples. It's, it's the night before the cross. He's with them. And he's pouring his heart out to them. And he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And, and I think when he, when he said, I wish, I so wish that we could have been there that night. Because I wish that we could have heard the tone in which Jesus shared these words. Because I, I believe that, that Jesus didn't share them in a tone of saying, well, hey guys, if you believe me, then you better do what I say. No, I think he said, he said, if you love me, right, if you love me because I loved you and I'm about to give my life for you, if you love me, if you love me, I want you to trust me enough to obey me, to obey what I've told you and what I've commanded you. Even when it doesn't make sense or even when it seems counterintuitive or even when it seems hard or not popular, guys, I want you to trust me and I want you to obey because you love me, because of the love that we have for each other. Jesus called his followers to do more than agree with him, right? God is not looking for intellectual agreement. He's not looking for just warm affection. He's calling us to a faith that trusts him not just for salvation, but trusts him to follow him with all of our life and to live a life of courageous faith. And so that's why our goal this week is this, is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. And it's my heart's desire, it's been my prayer for each of you, that in your time here, whether it's one week or two weeks or three or four, that God would do that for you, that he would help your faith to grow, that you would have a faith that's undeterred, that means persevering, right, despite the setbacks, right, despite the ups and downs and the challenges and the difficult moments and the failures and the days of doubt and all the struggles that we all go through, that you would have a faith that perseveres in spite of those things and positions you to fulfill the purpose that God has for your life and most importantly, positions you to bring glory and honor to God. And so this morning, I want us to see that courageous faith requires gospel-centered obedience. Gospel-centered obedience. Now, when we hear the word, there, there are some of you, and, and I would be included in this group, that when you hear the word obedience, you cringe a little bit. Anybody with me? Show me your hand. All right. I need to know my fellow rebellious people. All right. Your counselors have also written down your names. <laughs> so 
Sorry for, sorry for that. I, I kind of trapped you into that. No, I'm just kidding. There's some of us that when we see a list of rules, right, the first thing we think is what? Which ones don't apply to me, right? Have you, you been there, right? Yeah, I mean, these rules are for most people, but I'm special, right? And so I don't have to, I'm the exception. I don't have to obey probably number three, six, seven, and nine, 10, and 11, right? And so we, we, we just, we kind of, you know, when I hear the word obey, it, 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 it's kind of like a painful word for me, right? It's for children, and pets, right? Those are the things that should be obedient. How many of you as, as teenagers had a moment or two where you wished you were grown up so that you didn't have to listen to anyone tell you what to do anymore? Anybody? All right, just about every single one of you that are awake. Right, we've all had those moments where like, I just can't wait till I'm an adult and I wanna do what I wanna do and no one's gonna tell me what to do because we believe often that if we could just get our own way, we'd be happy. That happiness is found in fulfilling my desires, my wishes, my wants. If I could just get my own way, I would be happy. I would experience joy. That if I could just pursue the desires of my heart. Now, I'm not talking about God often gives us desires, good and godly things that he wants us to, to pursue in life. I'm not talking about those, but, but we think that the selfish or self-centered desires of our hearts, that if I could just have what I want, if I could get what I want, I would be happy. As followers of Jesus, we looked at yesterday that he calls us to live with humility, right? And to put others first and to put the interests of others ahead of our own. And this morning, Paul's going to continue in, in, in the book of Philippians to, to build on that thought and to talk about our obedience. And I want you to see that obedience is essential, right? Even if we push back or even if we think it's not what we want or not what is good, I, I want you to see that that gospel-centered obedience, obedience that's born out of a heart that has experienced the love of God for you in Christ, that has experienced the lavish love of your Savior who loves you unconditionally, who gave himself for you, who died in your place, who rose from the dead, who ascended to his Father, who is seated now at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says one of the things he's doing is praying for you. He intercedes for you. He loves you. He's rooting for you. He, he, he looks at you with so much love and so much affection. And he wants you to feel and know and experience and taste that love. And then out of having experienced that love and that joy of knowing him, to then trust him, to obey him. And so look at Philippians chapter 2. And we'll begin at verse 12. Paul says, So then... My dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, right, there's our word, obey, not only in my presence, but even now more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. And so as he's writing to them, he says, you know, because of what I've just shared with you about humility and about the example of Jesus, he says, my dear friends, he says, you, you've, you've, you've been obeying Jesus, you're doing well, and you didn't just do it when I'm there. You know how we tend to obey when we're being watched and then not obey when we're not being watched? I know none of you have ever done that, right? He says, you're, you're doing well, you're obeying, but he says, I want you to continue in that because this is the path that God has for you. And then he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so he's calling them to live out what God has worked in them, right? When, when he says to work out your salvation, he's not saying to work for your salvation. He's not saying that you have to earn your salvation, you can't. It's solely by grace through faith. He's not saying you have to earn God's love or his approval or his affection. All of those things are yours in Christ. But what he's saying is that what God has done in you, that we must participate in living it out. And so he's saying live out what God has done in you through Jesus Christ and through the gospel and through your faith in him. And so he says live it out. A relationship with God is not just about agreeing with him. Right? It's not just affirming or believing a set of facts. It's not just about going to heaven when you die, although that is our hope in Christ that we are going to be with him forever in heaven and then in new creation and new heavens and new earth. And so that is our hope, but it's, it's, it's about knowing Jesus now and living for him and being obedient to him and letting the gospel shape our life. So then Paul's going to share something very encouraging because he says, he says, work out your own salvation, right? And, and we're like, man, that's pretty, with fear and trembling. He says, take this seriously, right? This, this is serious. And that's heavy. But then notice what he says next. So encouraging. 
For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. And so he says, you don't have to feel this pressure that you've got to do all of this in your own strength or your own power. In fact, you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own power. And so Paul says, look, it's God who's working in you, right? The power, the Bible says the resurrection power of Christ is in us who are his followers. He says, God is in you. He's working. He's enabling you to both will, to change your want to, right? Because when, we, it, when it comes to obedience, we, we have to desire that. He says, God works on both our will and our actions. He's enabling us and empowers to live for him and his glory. Listen, the gospel is good news, right? That's what the word gospel means, Right? And the good news of the gospel is not that we have to try harder, but that we simply have to submit and to surrender to what God is doing in us through the power of His Spirit. The ability to have a courageous faith, the ability to trust God and to walk out and to live out the salvation that He's given you is not something you have to do in your own strength. It's not something you have to do in your own power or your own ability. He gives us the ability, but He does ask us and require us and call us to participate, right? to take action, and to live out what he is working in us through his power. And so Paul reminds the church at Philippi, he says, I want you to to work out what God has worked in you. I want you to be obedient to the gospel and to Jesus. And then he's going to give them a specific area that he wants them to live this out in. Of course, it's to be in every area of our life, but notice an area that is probably an issue that they were dealing with and certainly one that we deal with. Look at verses 14 and 15. Paul says, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. So here Paul's going to give a little bit of how and a little bit of why, right? Because whenever we're called to obedience, right, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, I understand that's what I'm supposed to do. But then we have to think about how am I supposed to do that and why? Right? We, if we don't know our why, we'll lose our way. So he says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. How many of you would say, I tend to complain a lot? All right? All right a lot of us. And I think we, we live, in, and it's easy because complaining is contagious. It's like a disease. Are you with me? Right? You can, have you ever noticed that when you're around someone that's complaining and it has a negative view of everything, what happens to your view? Somebody help me out. It becomes similar. And so we live in a world of complaining and arguing. Just go on, on social media, right? And everybody's arguing about everything every day, right? Because everybody's an expert on everything now. So we, we live in that world, but as followers of Christ, we're actually called to live distinctly and differently. And so Paul's going to say, do everything without grumbling and arguing. He says, don't be a complainer. Why? Because your life is saturated by the reality of the gospel. So he says, don't get your eyes on Jesus and who he is, what he's done for you, what he's called you to, and it will change your perspective. I want you to imagine that I was going to give you a a house, a, a mansion, all right, on a thousand acres of land, and I was going to give you $10 million in cash. Are you with me? I can't do that. All right. But I would if I could. So just imagine, right? Can you, you got your imagination going? All right, I know it's early. But just try to get the imagination. Now, I want you to imagine that I've, I've said, look, it's yours. All you have to do is come with me. And, and, and once we get to the house, you'll take possession of it. And there'll be $10 million in your account, and it's yours. And a half a mile away from the house, we ran out of gas. And we had to walk the rest of the way. How many of you would be upset with me and complain about having to walk the half mile? One. All right. There's always one in every crowd, right, who says, you idiot, why didn't you get gas, right? But most of you would say, I wouldn't even be really thinking about having to walk a half mile. Forget it. I'll run the half mile. You're giving me a, a mansion, $10 million, and 1,000 acres of land, right? Are you with me? Right? Your mind would be what? It would be consumed with, with what you had been given, that you wouldn't really notice the inconvenience. And what you've been given in Christ is so much greater. I mean so much greater than a house or money or possessions. Right? You've been given an inheritance in Christ that can never be taken away. The Bible says that it's kept in heaven for you, where it can't perish or fade or spoil. 
You have been given the privilege of knowing the God of the universe who created you and made you. And you've been called to his kingdom and his glory, which you will share forever and ever and ever. And we must saturate our minds with that truth and with that reality. Because when our minds are saturated with the love of God for us in Christ and what he's called us to and what is ours and the future that we have, then, then we will be able to overcome our complaining and our arguing and the things that we get distracted by. And Paul says in verse 15, he says, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God that are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars. Paul's saying our lives should look profoundly different because of the gospel at work in us, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? He says, he says you're to be blameless and pure. You're to be children of God who are faultless. Not, not, not perfect, but walking in the light, dealing with your sin, seeking Jesus, walking after him. And he says, when we do that, our lives will look distinctly different than the culture around us. The culture that, that Paul was writing to in, in Philippi, in the Roman Empire at this time, it was a godless society. It was pagan. They worshipped idols. They sacrificed things to idols. And, and they worshipped the Roman emperor. Like, it, it was not easy to be a follower of Jesus because it meant that you had to live a completely countercultural life, that you had to live a life that was looked as as foolish and crazy to the rest of the world. And in, in increasing ways, here in, even in our country, you are going to have to live that way because the values of Jesus' kingdom are always going to be in conflict with the values of this world. And we don't have to go around getting mad at the values of this world because they're just held by people who don't know Jesus. But we, as followers of Jesus, should be living distinctly. And he says that our lives should be shining like stars in the world. You know, if you've ever had the chance to go out in a really dark place and look up at the stars at night, it's, it's fascinating, it's breathtaking, it's amazing to see these objects that are so far away, so many of them are light years away, and yet their light shines in the darkness. And in such a way, God calls us to shine into a dark world, to reflect His love, His grace, His light, His values, His kingdom. It's not easy, right? It, it's easier to blend in. It's easier to fit in. When I was your age, my struggle was I wanted to blend in and fit in because I didn't want people to think I was weird, right? But people thought I was weird anyway, right? Are you with me? It is going to look a little weird to follow Jesus, but it's worth it because you've been called to it. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't, don't mold yourself to the, the patterns of this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. You have to think differently. You have to fill your mind with truth. He says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if we're going to live lives that are obedience, we have to constantly be reminding ourselves we're not to conform our lives, to pattern our lives after the world, but instead we're to transform our thinking through the truth of God's Word, whether it's through reading it or studying it, hearing it taught or preached, singing it, worshiping, right, renewing our mind, conversations with friends or mentors or people who speak truth to us, all those things help to renew our minds in the gospel. And then when we think differently, we'll be able to act differently. Back in Philippians chapter 2, Paul goes on, he says, hold firmly to the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run in vain or labor for nothing. Right? Paul says, he says, hold on, you know, be, hold on to this message, the gospel, the message of life. Cling to it. Believe it. Preach it to yourself. Speak it to yourself. Live it out. Then he says, then I can boast, I can brag in the day of Christ that I didn't run in vain or labor for nothing. You know, Paul was in prison, right, because of his testimony of the gospel and his faithfulness to Christ. And he was glad to be there for the sake of the gospel. But he says, I, I don't... I want what I've done to make a difference. And it wasn't in a vain way. It wasn't in a self-seeking way. But he wanted to know that his children were getting it. Listen, there, there's nothing better as a parent than when you see your children getting it. Right? When it, when it clicks. And they understand. And they trust. And they obey. And Paul felt that way about the church. I feel that way about all of you. I, I want you to get it. Because I know how good it is. And I want you to understand this incredible life God's called you to live. It's not easy. It's not safe. 
there's days of difficulty and pain. That's why we said we have to have a faith that, that, that perseveres despite those things. Right? There'll be times of darkness. There'll be times where God seems far. There'll be times where faith is not easy. Right? That, that, that is all part of the journey. But it is an incredible journey. And it is worth it because God has called you to know Him and to love Him. Paul said this in verse 17 and 18. He says, Even if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, he says, even if I die, even if I die serving you, he says, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. Right? I, I experience joy as you get it and as you walk with Jesus, we share joy. He says, in the same way, you should also rejoice and share your joy with me. Few things are more painful than loving someone and caring about someone and seeing them not get it and make choices that are unhealthy, unwise, or not good. And I want to see you make choices that are based on the truth, the truth of God's love for you, the truth of who He is, the truth of what He's called you to, and the truth of the hope that you have in Him. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus equated loving Him with obeying Him. And again, it wasn't out of anger or disapproval or frustration. It was spoken out of love for them. He loved them. Jesus was speaking to this the very night before He would go to the cross willingly for them. And He wanted them to get it. He wanted them to trust Him. He says, if, if you believe that Jesus loves you, if you believe that Jesus died for you, if you believe He's coming again, if you believe you're going to spend eternity with Him, would you not be willing to trust Him and obey Him? Back in verse 12, Paul said, So then, my dear friends, just as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even now more in my absence, as you guys go out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Live life obediently to Jesus in every area. Even when it goes against your desires, even when it goes against your feelings, even when it goes against what seems to be popular or what you think would make you happiest. Because just like the cactus was very deceptive to me, life can be very deceptive. We think that it's in pursuing our desires that will bring us joy and satisfaction, but it's actually in obeying and pursuing and knowing Jesus. And when we do that, and when we have a vision for that, Right? Our lives will shine like stars. And your life will be well positioned to fulfill the purpose for which God's created you and to bring Him the glory that He's designed you to bring. So I want to give you three questions real quickly to think about. Number one, are you seeking to live obediently to Jesus? And, and this probably should be a question that we all ask of ourselves often. Right? This is a maintenance thing that we probably all need to do, self-included. Am I truly seeking to live obediently to Jesus? And none of, us, none of us are going to do it perfectly, right? We will stumble, we will fail, we will fall short, and there is grace for that. But the desire, the trajectory of our life ought to be desiring to obey Him because He loves us. Number two, is there an area of your life in which you're disobedient? That, that even as you ask question number one, you know right now there's an area of your life that you're not aligning with the will and purposes of God. And that you, for whatever reason, and it doesn't really matter what the reasons are. You just be honest and say, there's an area of my life that's not in alignment with the will of God and the purposes of God. And if that's the case, God loves you. He wants you to bring that to Him. He wants you to confess it. He wants to set you free. There's grace for that. There's forgiveness. And there's power to live differently. And then the third question, going back to what Paul said about how, do you complain frequently? Because this is a really good barometer of how we're doing in our walk. Because when we're complaining a lot, We've taken our eyes off of Jesus. We've taken our eyes off the hope that we have in Him. And so I just want you to think about that. And I would like to challenge you to a 24-hour, all right, we'll begin at 9 o'clock, 24-hour no complaining challenge. Now, I, I did this with my church. I gave them a seven-day challenge, so you guys are getting off easy, all right? 24 hours, I want you to try to go and keep each other accountable. Let's see if we can go from 9 o'clock this morning till 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and you can even extend it if you'd like, without complaining. So when you catch yourself about to complain, just suck it back in. Let's see. Let's try to live out 
what God has worked in us. And it's my prayer for all of you to have a courageous faith. Let's pray. Father, uh, I thank you for your word and, and just how it reminds us of your love for us. Father, I know obedience, sometimes we push back against it because we're afraid that obeying will cause us to miss out on something good or that we think we should have. But Father, help us to realize you love us and that trusting you is actually the most logical thing that we could do because it's for our good. Father, help us to, to live lives of courageous faith and help our lives to shine like stars in a dark world. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.